great worship. I'm so glad that we had that worship, and I'm so glad that you guys are all here today to worship God. This is a Friday night Bible study we're doing, and uh, if you recall, we have been going through the I Am statements of Jesus uh, in the book of John. Jesus made a I Am statement. In fact, seven of them, he spoke about who he is. So, what we're really focusing on is not so much to what people say who Jesus is. We're not focused on what we think who Jesus is. What we are focusing on is what Jesus himself declare who he is. What Jesus says about himself, and that who he is. That is what we're interested in. And there are seven statements 
of Jesus saying, this is who I am in the book of John. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we went through uh, first one, which was, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. People probably thought he was like a new Moses because they were engaging in conversation where they were saying, you know, our ancestor was fed by Moses in the desert for 40 days. What can you offer to us? Not 40 days, 40 years, excuse me. Jesus then told them, uh, it wasn't Moses that gave the manna. In fact, it was my heavenly Father in heaven. He's the one who gave you this bread. Now he says, the true bread that God is giving you from down from heaven, I'm offering you this true bread. And people were saying, really? That's cool. And they said, give us this bread always. In other words, give us this t- bread today and tomorrow. Always give us this bread. Just like Moses uh, and the people in the wilderness, they were able to receive food from heaven for 40 years. He says, I- give me this bread. They really didn't understand what Jesus was offering. So Jesus says in John chapter 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So Jesus speaks about himself. You want the bread? I am that bread. I am the bread of life. With me, you would have life. If you believe in me, if you receive my word, then you would have life. And he was not talking about physical life. He was talking about eternal life, the life that the Christ offers. So Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We talked about that two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So he says, I am the light of the light of the world. I am the light of life. And when we think about what Jesus was saying in chapter 8, uh, we have to really refer to what, he, what event that took place. Why did he say this word? Why did he say he was the light in the world? Or when did he say it? So we hear about in chapter 8, starting from verse 1, we hear a Pharisee uh, brings a woman. They brought this woman to Jesus, and this woman was sinful. She was caught in adultery. She was having an affair. In the very act, she was brought to Jesus. Why was it brought to Jesus? Because they wanted to test Jesus. They wanted to test and trap Jesus. They brought to him, and it says, you know, the, Moses said, such a woman should be stoned to death. What would you say, Jesus? Instead of Jesus answering the Pharisee, he sat down and began to write on the ground. And they keep on asking, what are you doing? Jesus, what are you going to do? Are you going to punish her or are you going to let her go? See, that was a trap. The trap was simply, if you punish her with the stone, then you are not a very compassionate person. You are not very compassionate to this woman. Or if Jesus lets her go, then he will be accused as, hey, you're, you're going easy on God's law. You're breaking God's law. And so he was, they wanted to see. There was no way out. So Jesus sat down and began to write, keep on asking. And Jesus finally gets up and he says this, whoever has no sin, be the first to throw that stone. And then he sat down, began to write more. And then the Bible tells us from the older one first began to leave because they realized, I don't know what was written on the ground. Maybe it was sin that the people are committing. Maybe they saw their sin written on the ground. I don't know what it was. But older began to leave first and then everyone left. And Jesus told her, woman, she says, he says, woman, does anyone condemn you? He looked around. There's nobody. No, sir. No one's condemning me. 
And Jesus said, I will not condemn you as well. And then he says, go, go and sin no more. Go be free from that sin you're committing. So he says, sin, stop sinning. And he does not come. So this, this passage was actually very important because it's, it's really, there's only one person who is able to judge her, to condemn her. It wasn't the people because they're just the same sinners. Only Jesus without sin, that he is be the only person to condemn her. But he says, I will not condemn you. I will not condemn you. But go and sin no more. Meaning that he has forgiven her. Jesus did not condemn. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save through him. So Jesus allowed this experience, and the Pharisees now gather. And then while they're gathered, we get the chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. What Jesus is saying, that I am the only one who could forgive sin. I am the one in the darkness of your heart, in the sin that you have. I am the one who is able to deliver you. I am the one who could forgive you and cleanse you and make you new. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Now today we're going to go through uh, another I am statement of Jesus. When we think about I am, I want you to understand that when Jesus says I am, it's very important. It means that is a title to say that Jesus was God. I am means he always is. Okay, Presently he is. Uh, Jesus was not saying I was. Jesus is not saying I will be. Jesus is saying I am, which means eternally I am in the presence. Right now, right now, Jesus is I am, the great I am. And he's truly God. Uh, so one thing that we're going to look at today, another statement of Jesus, okay? So it says in verse 7 uh, of chapter 10, um, oh, I need to tell you what's happened before that, right? But let me just read this word, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get right into it, okay? So John chapter 10, verse 7 says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enter, enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you this, this, uh, tonight as we come for Friday night. I pray that you would truly open our eyes to see not what we think you are, what other people say you are, but understand truly what you said in your very own word, who you are. May we know who you are, and may we come into a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we read, excuse me, here we read, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, will be saved. So in the context of chapter 10 is actually given in chapter 9. Something happened. Jesus did something and the whole city gone crazy and wild. Jesus did something. What did he do? He healed a man who was blind from birth. He was a beggar. There's nothing the blind man could do for work. So what he, could he do to earn living? Is to ha he was a beggar asking for favor for people to donate money to him so he could survive. So he was a beggar. Jesus heals him and the whole city gone crazy. Why? Because this man uh, was healed and the neighbor first saw him and said, aren't you that guy? That was blind from birth? Oh, yes, I am. I am that person. And, and then it's like, wait, how is that that you see? And he says, a man named Jesus healed me. And so they were just, uh, just so surprised of what happened. A, a man named Jesus. 
why don't we take them to the Pharisee? So they brought the Pharisee, who is like the local leader or the governor. So they brought the Pharisee and just uh, uh, shared this testimony that he was born blind, but he was now is able to see. Okay? And the Pharisee says, what? And they were really upset about what happened. First of all, it was because Jesus healed this person on the Sabbath. That's first one. Second thing is because it's Jesus who healed him. Because Pharisees had a lot of problems with Jesus. They really didn't believe Jesus would be... Uh, they always had a conflict. And they always did not like what Jesus said. And so he, they were really upset about the situation. The Pharisee asked the blind man, uh, and he answered, was, who healed you? Jesus. Uh, you know that Jesus is not from God because like, he did, he, break, he broke in God's law, which is to work on Sabbath, and he began to talk to him. What happened? What happened? Keep on asking. So he, the blind man who opened his eye, he began to explain and it's like, wait, wait a minute. Maybe he wasn't really blind. Let's find out. So they went to go see the, the parents of this blind person and talk to them. It says, hey, uh, is this your son? Uh, was he born, truly born blind? And, and how is it that he could see right now? So he asked the parents. And parents were very frightened because they were part of this Jewish community. Okay, and the Pharisee was the leader. It was, they were guiding them, right? And so uh, they didn't want to be on the wrong side of the leader. So they said, uh, uh, that is my son. And yes, he was born blind. But you're asking me how he is able to see? Why don't you ask my son? Since he's old enough to explain himself. And the reason they did that is because they were afraid that they'll be outcast by the leader of the Pharisee. So they went back to the blind man, and, and who is this person? He was Jesus. Oh, and, and then he, the, the man who is able to see began to speak to them and said, hey, how could anybody do this if it's not from God? And then that really pushed the button for the Pharisees. The Pharisees were saying, are you trying to lecture us? And they cast them out from their community. They no longer are part of the temple. And they are no longer part of the community. Their family is all uh, just cast from their, their community. They're not allowed to join their worship or be part of their, their community. Can you believe that? This man was blind. He's now seeing. Instead of rejoicing and being thankful and, and being glad, they were upset that this two men, uh, this, this blind man, is now going to follow Jesus. That this family is now going to follow Jesus. So Pharisees were more concerned. They were more concerned about losing their members. They were, uh, they were more concerned about his own people following Jesus instead of following them. So they were really upset and they cast them out from their community. I want you to understand something about Jesus. Jesus meets them again and talks to the blind man. And uh, he basically says, I am that man who healed you. And he began to worship and he began to follow Jesus. And then Jesus said, if you were blind, uh, I'm sorry. Jesus said, I came to make the blind to see and make those who see blind. Pharisees said, are you talking to us? Are you saying we're blind? Jesus said, if you are blind, you have no guilt. Since you cannot see, I get it, right? Uh, but since you say I could see, your guilty remains. Saying that, you claim to see God. You claim to have a relationship with God. You, begin, you claim that you know God, but you really don't. And those people who do not have a relationship with God, he offers that relationship. So today, so as we are talking about chapter 10, this is the context of what's happening. Now, uh, in chapter 10, uh, Jesus uh, continues to 
dialogue with Pharisees and the, rule, uh, and the ruler of Israel. They were the leaders of the people. And Pharisees are the one who were telling people how to follow God. And their people depend on the Pharisee to know about God because they were the elite, they were religious, and they pray, and they, they're very religious people. The problem with this Pharisee was they're very religious people. They fast, they pray, and they, they study the scripture and all that, but they had no relationship with God. In fact, they, didn't even, they weren't really concerned about God. They would care more about their power, their control. They were the leaders who abused and mistreated the people, who, who always sought after controlling the people, using their power to control and mistreat the people, as we saw in chapter 9. Chapter 10 it speaks about Jesus simply talking to a story to the Pharisee about the relationship with the shepherd and his sheep. And it says in verse 10, uh, chapter 10, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, those who does not enter through the door and or climb or, you know, come in other way, they're thieves and robbers. Who is he talking about? He was talking about the leaders of Israel, the Pharisees. They are like the robber. They rob you and they're like the thief. They do not come through the door. But it says, but one who enters through the door is a true shepherd. The one who comes into the door, obviously, if somebody was, you know, going in the house through the like windows or climb the fence, we know that's not the owner of the house, right? <laughs> because they shouldn't be doing that. And when we see someone walk into the front door and unlocks the door and goes in, we could kind of assume that that person is the owner of the house or person who belonged to that house. And so Jesus says, one who climbs the fence to, to the sheep is not the real shepherd. They're the thief. And referring to the Pharisee. Um, and then he says, sheep recognize his voice and shepherd calls him by name. So sheep recognizes the voice of the shepherd and the shepherd calls him by name. Do you know that in the old days, the shepherd named their sheep? Oh, you're fluffy. Oh, you're tiny. Oh, and then they just name you're big, right? So they named it. And that's not very strange because we all name our dogs, right? We I have a two dogs. Uh, now it's one. This week, my, one of my dogs passed away. Uh, but we named them Cinnamon and Coda. And uh, basically, we just call them by name. What if you have a dog and you don't give any name? A uh, dog? <laughs> we all give this name. So it's not a strange thing. So it's a shepherd gives him the name of the shepherd. So it's, it's talking about this relationship with the shepherd and the sheep. It's very intimate. They know the voice. And if they don't recognize the voice, they're afraid to go to them. Right? If they don't recognize the voice, they will turn away. But because the sheep recognize the voice of the shepherd, they have this intimacy and the shepherd leading them, protecting them. And then Jesus says, after talking about that relationship with the sheep and the shepherd, verse 7 tells us, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And verse 8 said, And who came before me? are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. So Jesus saying, truly, truly, I say, I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. I am the door he speaks about. So first thing that I want you to understand in this, in this uh, lesson is that Jesus is the door. What is the door? Door is the one that you open up and where you enter or you exit. It, it, it opens up to a place that uh, it separates from a place and is, is a place where you go in or out. We have a lot of doors at home, right? You guys have doors, right? What if your bathroom didn't have a door? That would be very crazy, right? Every place we have door. And Jesus says, I am the door. 
Jesus is the only door to eternal life. He's the only door to find forgiveness of sin. Jesus is the only door for a relationship with God. See, Jesus says, I am the door. And if you open and you come in, you will find this thing. What Jesus is proclaiming to the Pharisees, the religious leader that was there and the others, he says, I am the door. I am the only door where you could enter to have a relationship with God. Jesus is a door to eternal life. It, later on, it was so, so vivid that Jesus actually went to the cross. Jesus took the punish from God and he died, and then he was raised by God, conquering grave and death. He has no power over Christ. He defeated the devil. He was raised back to life. He was a door in which you and I could enter in. He's a door where we could enter into the forgiveness and new life and eternal life in him. Pharisees were arrogant. They really didn't get it. They were very prideful. And they say, they see, I already know that. I already know. And so because their arrogance and their pride, Jesus, they never had discovered this great opportunity where Jesus says, I am the door. You could come in and you could have a relationship with God. But they missed it. So verse 9 tells us that there is another invitation there's an invitation of Jesus to including the prideful of Pharisees and all the others. He says in verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Jesus says, I am the door. And he's offering himself at the door of salvation. If anyone who comes through me, if anybody will come through me, you will find salvation. I am the door for salvation. He's the only way we could be saved and have life. And not just ordinary life, abundant life, a fullness of life he offers. <coughs> There is no other name given under heaven by which we could be saved. Only one door that could be open for salvation. And that door is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the door. You want your sins forgiven? You want to have a relationship with God? You want to enter into heaven when you die? You have to come through a person he is the door, door of salvation. Jesus Christ is the door of salvation. And you must, there's no other way. You must come through Him. So, maybe you don't, you never came into that door. Maybe you never really believed in God. I want to give you an opportunity to do that tonight. You could find a relationship. You could find the forgiveness of your sin. You could find the, the joy of salvation, of eternal life. And that can never be found in any other place, only through a person. And you could only enter through Jesus because he's a door of salvation. Join me in prayer. <coughs> Father God, we thank you so much that you give us this word. God, truly you are the door where we could come in and have a relationship with you. There is no other way. And you said, I am the door. And if anyone comes through me, we'll be saved. I pray right now for those, Father, that do not know you, will have a, such a faith in you, that they will believe in you. They believe that, Lord, you died for their sin and you were raised back to life. And by simply believing and trusting in you for salvation, God, you will save us. We thank you for that salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, thank you so much for being with me on Friday night. I know it's not easy, but uh, uh, I just want to congratulate you. I wanna, I'm very proud of you, and truly, I love you, and I will see you guys again. Goodbye.